Okay, so welcome along ladies and gentlemen to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very lucky to be joined by Shannon Bennett who's come down to us from the California Academy in San Francisco. Uh, Shannon uh, did a BS in Biology at McGill University in Quebec, Canada, uh, and uh, then a, a PhD at the uh, University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Her research uh, revolves around uh, viruses and uh, the transmission of viruses between different species as we're going to hear about uh, today in her talk. Uh, after she finished her PhD she did a postdoc uh, at uh, University of Texas and uh, also uh, has been a researcher at the University of uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, she's obviously interested in tropical climates uh, and uh, that uh, comes into account because of her interest in uh, mosquito-borne viruses. Uh, she uses uh, genomic analysis to, uh, to track the evolution of viruses uh, and has done so at uh, the University of Hawaii since 2004. And then last year she moved across to the California Academy and, and uh, took up a position as the Associate Curator for Microbiology. So if you'll join me in welcoming Shannon. Everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here. I spent this morning talking to uh, people at the, uh, at the Institute about potential collaborations for, for studying how life on Earth evolves and how this is a good analog for how uh, life on our planet will respond to climate change. So uh, I'm very, uh, very interested in, in, in evolution and diversity of life and where it occurs on our planet. I focus on these unique microcosms, microbes, uh, that are parasitic, that are living inside and responding to, to host microcosms, cosmos environments. So I'm going to, I realized when we announced my title that I forgot to mention microbes, but that will be the specific focus of my interest, is how microbes are responding uh, in terms of uh, evolutionary forces that shape their trajectory. And uh, I've, I've studied a lot of different kinds of pathogens, but today I'm going to talk about um, mosquito-borne viruses, so microbes, um, uh, viral microbes that uh, live in mosquitoes. And then we'll talk about some, some small mammal viruses that we've been working on in the hantavirus genus. So I think I have to go over here to advance my slides. So I always try to um, uh, tell people why uh, the diversity of microbes and how they're distributed on our planet is really an important human health issue as well. And I bring, uh, to, to, for my example, some of the latest emerging infectious diseases. And what I want to tell you about in this slide is that when we have a new infectious disease, it's always been tied to an evolutionary event, almost always. So, the, so these microbes, these viruses that, that are uh, emerging and becoming a major human health threat are evolving at the same time. So it's really critical that we understand where diversity is stored in nature and what happens to that diversity over time when we have changing landscapes. And this scales up to some of the uh, climate change uh, issues that we're for, uh, facing in the next uh, few decades. So um, an emerging infectious disease is any disease that's newly recognized, so a new pathogen. But it also can refer to a pathogen that suddenly changed its distribution, either in space or in host distribution, or increased its, its uh, incidence, so become more abundant in a given host or set of hosts. And I bring to your, uh, to your attention West Nile virus, which expanded across the United States uh, in, in on force starting in, in 2001, and then by 2002 it had spread across the United States. This is a pathogen we've been well aware of. It's a virus we've been well aware of that uh, is endemic in, in Africa and was not known in the United States or in Europe for that matter until recent years. Uh, I also bring to your attention a dengue virus, which I'll be talking a lot more about. Um, dengue virus emerged from a, a sylvatic or jungle cycle in non-human primates, and, uh, and the mosquitoes that live in the canopy 
and switched into human hosts as, as humans became abundant enough to sustain dengue virus transmission and human adapted mosquitoes. And then, of course, the, the example of highly pathogenic avian influenza, or H5N1. So these are all viruses that are capable of responding, uh, evolving very quickly to changes in their environment. In the case of H5N1, it was a change in how, we, uh, how the, the wild the bird hosts were being contained. And with the onset of, of factory farming and increases in host density, the, um, a virus that was normally in migratory birds was able to uh, inhabit domesticated birds and then evolve to be more pathogenic because the hosts were so densely contained that they could uh, sustain a high virulence in, uh, in, in, in terms of transmission. So in all cases, emerging events, and these are only th uh, three examples of many, from SARS uh, to HIV to uh, um, numerous numbers of, par of parasites and pathogens and microbes. In all cases, a significant change in the environment and an emergent event was accompanied by evolution, whether it's an evolution of the virus to change how it behaves in mosquitoes, which is what happened in West Nile virus, a switch in its host specificity, which is what happened in dengue virus, or a change in how virulent it was. They were all tied to evolutionary events in the genome. So what I want to know in my research program is, is how uh, do, do unique changes or diversity that's in the population of microbes, for example, turn into an event uh, that's uh, important to human health or important to life on Earth as we know it, an emergent event. So we both need to understand where diversity is stored. And it's stored in populations of viruses that are existing in some form. And then what happens? What's the fate of that diversity over time and in response to different environmental conditions? So it's really all about uh, identifying the forces of evolution that are acting on pathogens. So this, the, the source of diversity or the source of all variation is mutations. And mutations in viruses occur at a very rapid rate because of the way they copy themselves, which is highly error prone, not at all like the way we copy ourselves, our genome. So um, in terms of uh, defining evolution, I want to get us all on the same page. Evolution simply refers to change. And so change over time, biological change over time, is the focus of biological evolution. So as Darwin put it, descent with modification over time. And it, in, in essence, it's the change in frequencies of inherited traits over time, over successive generations. And so what we see in populations of viruses, there may be a variant here or a variant there. When that variant goes from rare to common to 100% fixed, we see evolution or a replacement of the common form of life in that population. So first we start with a variant, which is mutation. The fate of those mutations is acted on by two forces, genetic drift and natural selection. Genetic drift is the random fixation of a variant in a population. It's not due to any benefit or detriment that that mutation might have on the organism. Whereas natural selection is the fixation of a variant because it confers a benefit. That mutation confers a benefit to that organism. And you might imagine that if we're studying uh, variants that reach fixation because they're emerging, emergent infectious diseases, you imagine that those mutations confer some benefit. They, they uh, enable the pathogen to replicate more quickly, uh, adapt to different, many different kinds of hosts, or become uh, more virulent and make more copies of themselves within a host. So, natural so distinguishing between the fate of a variant and whether it becomes fixed randomly through no uh, effect, beneficial or detrimental effect of that variant, or whether it's under strong natural selection has a huge impact on whether that pathogen will be detrimental to the human population or life on Earth as we know it. There are other processes that, that are important in evolution. Recombination is the reshuffling of the basic uh, diversity into different combinations. And, and many viruses have the capacity to exchange segments of their genomes with other uh, populations and other variants. And this gives it an incredible plasticity to respond to environmental change. So for example, influenza is a segmented virus that can exchange genome segments with other influenza strains. 
and therefore adapt very quickly to infect uh, birds or mammals uh, and, uh, and different kinds of mammals. So it's a very nimble virus because it's so, its capacity to recombine is so great. And gene flow is something that uh, we refer to as the movement of genes between populations. And it's becoming a huge issue in today's society because we really are a global environment now. Many species move across the globe within a few hours. Uh, they're capable. And infected, uh, an infected individual can carry a virus around the world. So we have gene flow, which is the exchange of different variants into different populations. So the study of evolution in terms of pathogens um, has been a coined phylodynamics. And this is a f what, what we call a phylogenetic tree. It's a tree. It's called a tree because it has branches and, and the branches join to a common trunk, for example. So it looks like a tree. And, but what it's symbolizing is how things are related to each other. So any two tips, for example, can be related to each other by a shared uh, coming together of the two branches, what we call a coalescing of these two tips into a shared uh, node. We call it a node. And that node is rep it represents a shared common ancestor. So these two tips are related to each other more closely than this tip is to this tip because they share a common ancestor further uh, away, deeper in evolutionary time. Within a population, there are many variants, and that's really what we're interested in, is how many variants there are and what happens to them over time. Okay, enough with the background. I'm going to get into some data. Well, maybe a little bit. First, an overview. So what's really cool about the work that I do that I think is really cool about it, is that I'm studying viruses that evolve so quickly, I can see major evolutionary events in my lifetime, in my career. So the payoff is great. They're evolving so quickly that in a few decades, we can see major change. So uh, I, I liken it to a living fossil record. I have a giant minus 80 freezer full of samples of viruses from human sera and from mosquitoes that at the top shelf is recent time and at the bottom shelf I have viruses from the 1940s and even farther back in time. So it's like a living fossil record and I can take different strata at different depths in time, different depths of my minus 80 freezer and I can pull those viruses out and I can query their genomes and I can see how they've evolved in real time and I can watch it happening. So that's really a, a wonderful opportunity. And I'm going to present some of the data that I have on how dengue virus is evolving in space and time by drilling down through this living fossil record at my disposal. Then I'm also going to present a little bit of the work that I'm doing on hantaviruses. Now the hantavirus issues uh, are, the, the evolution of hantaviruses and the questions I'm interested in are occurring deeper in evolutionary time than my min minus 80 freezers can capture. And so what we're really looking here in, in, these kind, in this study is we're, we're taking a broader picture of hantaviruses that exist today in present time and maybe the last five or ten years, and we're trying to infer distant evolutionary events, like how they speciated uh, uh, over millions of years ago or hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, so that is a lot of inference. And we use these phylogenetic trees to infer both um, what's going on in terms of forming the trees in the living fossil record as well as inferring uh, in deep ancestry over time. And then finally, I'm, I'm really interested in looking at the ecological drivers that shape the viruses and their, um, their diversity. And so I'll be uh, looking at some of the mosquitoes and, and their other environmental factors like the endosymbionts that are in those mosquitoes and we're going to present some, some new techniques we've been, we've been looking at to, to drill through the entire community of pathogens and microbes. So, so dengue virus is a mosquito-borne virus. These are the two main vectors that carry dengue virus, uh, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. Aedes albopictus has just arrived. It's an Asian mosquito. It's called the Asian tiger mosquito. It's a very effective vector of dengue virus, and it's just become established in the LA area. Uh, it's well known on the, on the East Coast, and both of these uh, mosquitoes occur on the East Coast in Florida, and anybody who's been aware of the dengue outbreaks in Florida over the last couple of years, uh, these are the two vectors that have been uh, promoting dengue virus transmission on the East Coast. Now we have 
one of the vectors here in California, and it may move north. So um, this could, could become very topical. Dengue is a very close cousin to West Nile virus, which we already have well established here in California. It's transmitted by a different mosquito, however. So all mosquitoes are not equal. And that's why we need to know something about the different mosquito species. We have um, a, a, about 170 species of mosquitoes here in California, some of which can carry West Nile virus, some can carry malaria. So um, dengue virus is really specific to primate hosts. Unlike West Nile virus, which transmits amongst avian hosts and spills over into humans and horses and other mammals, Dengue is specific, and this provides us with a unique challenge because it's very difficult to study the virus and, and the, the effects of the genetic mutations that we observe in any kind of laboratory model. So we have no mammalian model to study this in the lab, but we use different cell culture um, assays and we can study them in, in the mosquitoes. So I, I mentioned to you that dengue virus evolved in a sylvatic cycle. So it diversified into four species in these non-human primates. And you can see that in this phylogenetic tree. Um, the phylogenetic tree I'm showing here depicts viruses at the tips that we've sampled. And these have been sampled through time. They span about four decades. And you can see that the, the virus serotypes shown here, or the species we call them, we call them serotypes, are clearly uh, very distinct. So we have dengue 1, dengue 2, dengue 3, and dengue 4. And what we use this model to look at, dengue virus, is to ask what are the drivers of ongoing dengue emergence. So dengue evolved in non-human primates and it diversified into these four species or serotypes. We know that because the sylvatic strains or jungle strains shown in pink here, at least three of the four serotypes have been found in non-human primates. So that suggests that they diverged or diversified in non-human primates, and then each one independently spilled over into humans. As they spilled over into humans, they became their own independent lineages. So there's a, a, a human form, the, the human forms of dengue virus shown here in black, of each serotype, and up there. We think that this event was uh, correlated with when humans became uh, dense enough in space to sustain the virus and that there were specific mosquitoes that had adapted to live and feed on humans, live around and feed on humans to transmit the virus. So about a few hundred years ago, starting 300 years ago, the virus started to jump into humans and all four species has jumped independently into humans and since diversified. So um, the shown here are the, are the names of what we call genotypes or distinct groups of the virus within each species. And they were named or, originally for the geographic region where they were discovered and they tended to, to um, disseminate. But in fact, uh, they've now gone global. Many of these genotypes have spread to other geographic regions of the world. The point that I want to uh, show with this is that there is a lot of diversity and structure in the virus. So it switched into humans and then it kept evolving. So we had a major evolutionary event when it switched into humans which is significant in of itself, and it was linked to a, a protein on the virus coat called the envelope gene. And in each case, there were many changes in the envelope gene that occurred when the virus moved from non-human primates to humans. But what's been happening since, and that's really what my interest in dengue virus is, what's been shaping the diversity in deng of dengue virus in humans since then? Is it all random? because the viruses evolve so quickly, they generate mutations, and some by random luck may become fixed in populations and cause them to be different. So a lot of this diversity and structure could be random. However, we know that dengue virus is becoming more and more common in many new geographic regions like Florida. We know that it's becoming more common globally. So we have a good hypothesis that some of the diversity in dengue virus is being generated by adaptation by natural selection. So it's not random because it's linked to a phenotype, a phenotype of expansion. So we're going to use dengue virus as a model to ask what are the genetic changes in dengue virus that are correlated with this expansion. So I, um, <coughs> I put this up to show you that dengue really is expanding. We, we think about our own backyard. We think about Florida. I've come from Hawaii where dengue is becoming more active. 
uh, Puerto Rico, which is a United States uh, territory also, dengue is very active. But really, on a global scale, dengue is becoming more and more active. So over the last few decades, shown here, uh, dengue virus, both in terms of the number of cases, uh, shown by these bars and this, uh, the right-hand axis for you, and then and the number of countries reporting dengue virus shown by this line, both are increasing dramatically, especially in the last two decades or three decades. So both geographic expansion and more severe epidemics in terms of case numbers is a phenomenon associated with dengue. And part of this is because dengue is now overlapping, all four species are becoming overlapping in range, in geographic range. And we call this hyperendemicity. So for any given country that might have been reporting uh, one of the serotypes or two, they now all four are, are um, being reported. And, and this is a, a, a trace of the viruses and the virus abundance in terms of, of um, each serotype color-coded over time. And you can see early on in the 70s, Beyond this graph, there would be one or two, and now multiple serotypes are co-occurring over time. And there's a lot of dynamics going on here that we'd like to understand. So is there a periodicity to the uh, peaks of the virus abundance in a given population? And if so, what's driving it? Is the virus that's occurring here the same as this virus? And it's just a matter of, of um, mosquito abundance and, and climatic conditions, or are the viruses significantly different? So, um, you know, dengue is a, a puzzle in many ways. Reporting dengue is very uh, dicey because in most cases, the dengue viruses cause asymptomatic disease. And I, I liken dengue to a, a, an iceberg in which the, the cases of dengue that are, are diagnosed, that are even reported to the clinic, are just the tip of the iceberg. And in many cases, there's a lot of virus circulating out there. And it represents an unplumbed depth in terms of the, uh, the diversity that might be stored in these viruses that are circulating and when and how they become uh, uh, emerging to cause significant disease. And so we have some techniques to, to look at all the viruses in a population to understand uh, where the diversity is stored in space and time and when it becomes significant in terms of the phenotype that it causes in the human host, the disease. So um, there are many uh, aspects to why dengue might cause a severe outbreak or a severe disease uh, in, a, in a given human. And a lot of this has to do with the human environment, the host exposure, uh, the transmission arena, how many mosquitoes there are, the species of mosquitoes, it's, um, it, its way of biting. Aedes aegypti is a very skittish mosquito, and it will take sips of blood from your ankle, and it'll get scared off very easily. And so it'll actually take many sips from many different people in the room. So it's an excellent transmitter because it can infect many people for a given blood meal. So the biology of the mosquito is very important in terms of tracking the dynamics of transmission of dengue viruses. It turns out that different humans are, humans are not all equal. So some humans uh, have different uh, predilections, genetic dispositions to being infected, different susceptibilities. And then there's incredible amount of virus strain variation, which I already showed you. And my, the focus of my research is to understand how variation in the viruses is correlated with changes in disease severity and emergence in response to different um, environments. So I use a comparative approach. I study dengue across the globe in different populations that are going through change. So I'm looking at change in, uh, in the transmission dynamics of the virus, change in, in terms of its degree of emergence, and I want to correlate that back to changes in the virus genotype and try to hold those other variables equal. Uh, so, for example, in Hawaii there's been geographic expansion, but it's in a population that's generally naive. So we can rule out host exposure history as being uh, um, a factor. In Puerto Rico, we've had severe epidemics periodically in an arena that's had long-term co-circulation of multiple viruses. Uh, and um, we, I'm going to focus on a 1998 outbreak of dengue 4 in, in terms of uh, the genetic changes that have occurred in the virus correlated with peak ep epidemics. We have other populations that are going through dramatic changes. In Sri Lanka, 
there was a, a sudden onset of very severe form of the disease. I showed you the tip of the iceberg. Um, some clinical cases progress to dengue hemorrhagic fever. And when more and more of those cases occur, it's suggestive that the virus itself is more virulent or something else has happened. In the case of Sri Lanka, we have good evidence that the virus suddenly became more virulent and caused more cases of dengue hemorrhagic fever than it should have. And in the South Pacific, we have the opposite effect. We uh, observed an, uh, an event in which the virus was sweeping through a series of islands in the South Pacific and it was highly virulent, and then it arrived in Tonga in 1974, and it was almost uh, completely attenuated. So people, uh, cases were being identified that were asymptomatic entirely. So we can look at the converse. How is the virus evolving um, attenuation? So it means I get to go to some cool places in the world. <laughs> and avoid getting infected by virus. I'm, I'm baseline negative, so all the years I've traveled in dengue endemic areas, I still haven't had the infection, knock on wood. So what we do is we collect virus genomes, and, the, and virus genomes are very small in many cases, at least the RNA viruses that I study. They're very simple genomes. They consist, in the case of dengue, of a single, what well, you might call it a chromosome if you're used to thinking about human, the way humans store its ge their genomes. But it's basically a single strand of RNA rather than DNA. And it's, it, it has, uh, it's very uh, efficient. It has some genes that encode for the structure of the virus, the, the capsid coat, and some proteins that stick off that negotiate host cell entry and um, elicit your immune response. And then it has a, a bunch of genes that are, are non-structural genes that encode for how the virus replicates itself, how it cleaves itself into different proteins. So we call these the non-structural genes. And they have a very important uh, effect on how the virus replicates or copies itself. So you might imagine that if we see hot spots of genetic evolution in the non-structural genes, then maybe the virus is evolving uh, to be more efficient as a replicator in host cells. Whereas if we see hot spots of evolution in structural genes, you might imagine that the virus is evolving to escape an immune response, or maybe it's becoming adapted to a different kind of host. And if you think back to the tree I showed you when, when the virus is spilled over from non-human primates into humans, which was a major host switch event, both, both in terms of the vertebrate, but also in terms of the kinds of mosquitoes that were being infected, we saw hot spots of evolution in each independent spillover event all in the envelope gene, which encodes for the proteins that stick off the surface of the virus. So by tracking where the changes occur in the viral genomes in response to some kind of phenotype that we observe, like more severe disease or more cases or new hosts involved, then we can infer the function of those genetic mutations, which is what we want to understand on a global scale. So we isolate viruses and we extract them from these historical samples. Remember I told you the samples come from different uh, timelines in the, in the minus 80 freezer. And we, we characterize the genomes, the whole genome of the viruses, which is a pretty simple endeavor. And then, and then we, um, we construct, we use a bunch of statistical algorithms to construct phylogenetic trees to show us how different viruses are related to each other over time. And once we do that, we can map the significant changes onto the tree. Just like I showed you how we mapped where hot spots in the envelope gene were occurring and which evolutionary events they were associated with. So we knew the envelope was evolving each time uh, in, in those different lineages. So we can take a phylogenetic tree, we can map changes onto the tree, so we can identify evolving lineages and evolving sites in the genome. And then we can do stati statistical tests to ask, were these changes fixed randomly? Because they can be fixed randomly and still have a phenotypic effect. Or were they fixed by adaptive evolution? We do this by, by a, a statistical algorithm called comparing DNDS. DN stands for the rate of non-silent substitutions, and DS stands for the rate of silent substitutions. So if um, Silent sub if non-silent substitutions are much more common than we would expect under a random evolutionary process, and under random evolutionary processes, such as virus evolution, we expect silent substitutions to occur at a certain basal rate. They're called silent because uh, the, f 
the, they have no, we, we presume that they have no effect on the phenotype or the proteins of the virus. So if you uh, recall your Biology 101, RNA and DNA, uh, it occurs in codons of three, triplets of three. And sometimes you can have a, a mutation at one position and there is no change in the amino acid that's encoded. And we expect that kind of a change to be silent. In other cases, depending on the position of the codon where that mutation occurs, the amino acid could be changed. And if the amino acid is changed, it could have effects on the protein and the downstream phenotype or behavior of the organism. Uh, and then finally, we can, we can use um, the shape of the tree itself to infer the true population size of the viruses. So we can use diversity to tell us how many viruses are out there and changes in diversity to tell us how <coughs> emerging viruses are evolving. And this is kind of like the Florida panthers. Uh, in populations of very low diversity, in which they're mostly homogeneous individuals genetically, those populations are usually very small. Populations that are very large, like humans, tend to be very heterogeneous, very mixed, very diverse. And so this becomes a powerful tool for estimating the base of that iceberg. We can understand how, how diverse that base and how large that, that the base of that iceberg really is. And that tells us how, how the virus is changing in response to the environment, how its diversity is changing. So I'm going to take you to Puerto Rico to a hyper-endemic environment where all four serotypes have been circulating for decades. And you can see dengue one, two, three, and four shown here. And how over time, there's a distinct dynamic. The viruses cha are changing in abundance. Some, uh, some viruses in, in this year, dengue two was very dominant, and here again, and in this year, dengue four became very dominant. And so there, there's definitely a, a cyclical pattern and a periodicity that really uh, provides a lot of backdrop for us to study how the genomes are changing in response to both each other and their relative abundances. Uh, it's also highly seasonal, and that's really tied back to the mosquitoes. So these are mosquito-borne viruses, and the mosquitoes themselves are changing dramatically in space and time in response to n many, many factors from habitat destruction, uh, growth of human populations in hot, in hot spots of urbanization, um, slum areas and, and climate change. So humidity and rainfall and temperature are very important to mosquito distribution. So what I really want to ask is, is how the virus genome is changing on this highly dynamic epidemiologic landscape. And this is some of our first results that show you the dengue 4 virus phylogeny. And these are, are, are viruses that have been sampled over time and they're color-coded by year. So these were when the virus was first introduced into Puerto Rico. This is dengue 4 virus. Uh, it was in 1981-82, and it's shown here. And then we picked different year groups to sample over time, drilling down through our minus 80 freezer. And we found that, the, that viruses did separate by year group into distinct lineages. And so uh, to answer the first question, are the viruses different? Yes, they are different. They're different from year to year. So the viruses during this outbreak were very different from these low years of viruses, virus transmission. And these viruses, although they're not so different, you see how they're phylogenetically nested. The next year, the 1998 viruses that were responsible for a huge outbreak in Puerto Rico shown up there, oh, oh pointer, I keep forgetting, um, are very distinct. So these are shown in red. And you can see here that, that the virus mutations that they all share, uh, shown here, uh, identified a hot spot in the virus genome in a non-structural gene. And we still don't really understand exactly what that gene does, but we're coming up with experimental assays to determine what it might do. But the, the, um, the bottom line is that although uh, there's been a lot of random evolution unassociated with specific protein changes, there was an event, a non-random event, in which several amino acids in a non-structural gene became fixed at a very high rate relative to random non uh, silent changes. And they were correlated with the emergence of this lineage in red that was responsible for a severe outbreak. So we suspect that uh, we've identified a region in the viral genome that determines how the virus might replicate, how fast and how efficient it might replicate because it's in a non-structural gene. But the non-structural gene's also been tied to certain um, 
immune pathway cascades that occur in humans and the interferon regulation. And so these might also be important. So I, I alluded to, to dis determining the importance of natural selection versus genetic drift. And I, I just want to show you this graphic because it's really key to understanding the significance of evolution in terms of human health um, and, and with respect to, to dengue virus in particular. So you might have a, a mutation show up in the population. It might be neutral. It might occur in, uh, in the codon region where it, the amino acid is not affected, or it might change the amino acid, but the amino acid it's, it's, uh, doesn't uh, perform a, a really important function. Although with dengue virus, it's a pared down genome, and pretty much every amino acid could be important. If it's a neutral mutation, we expect over time that the frequency of this mutation in the population will wobble around and then maybe become fixed or maybe be driven to extinction. And so this is, this is random genetic drift. A mutation might become fixed. It might still have a phenotypic effect, but it wasn't fixed by strong uh, natural selection. On the other hand, if a mutation is distinctly advantageous, if it changes the amino acid, and that amino acid confers a replicative benefit or an ability to infect a novel host, it might be advantageous. And we expect that over time, we will see this fixation, uh, this mutation reach fixation with a frequency of one very quickly in terms of generations. So this is time on this axis in terms of generations, and this is the frequency of a mutation. If it's a deleterious mutation, we expect it to be wiped out of the population very quickly. Individuals bearing that mutation will not be able to, will have a lower fitness, will not be able to survive or reproduce as effectively in the population, and will quickly go extinct. And that's shown in the yellow trace here. So by asking ourselves the fate of a mutation over time, whether it's fixed extremely rapidly, whether it's fixed at a neutral rate, or whether it's wiped out rapidly, and we almost never see these, so we really just compare the green with the red, we can ask whether strong natural selection has occurred. And that's what we asked uh, with the NS2A mutations. They could have been neutral, but they, it turns out that they weren't neutral, that, um, that they were fixed in a, in a background. So the rate of fixation, and, and we tracked it down to a, a two-year fixation rate, um, where they started out as being very rare in the population and became fixed at 100%. And the background of, no, of silent mutations was so much lower that um, we inferred that the, the DNDS ratio or the selective benefit of those mutations was very great, was much, much greater than one. So if it's neutral, those two ratios will be one. Uh, if it's deleterious, it'll be much less than one. So if you, um, if you sequence all forms of life, and you try to measure DNDS, the universal ratio that we tend to see in life is 0.13. And that, that means that basically most of the mutations that occur across all forms of life, from eukaryotes to bacteria, are, um, most of them are deleterious. And so our genomes purge them, or they're purged, and they never become fixed. So most mutations are deleterious or neutral. So to see a ratio much, much greater than one, over a background of about 0.13, means that these were fixed very rapidly, and they're likely to have an extreme phenotypic effect. Okay, so that got us really excited. Um, the, the other question we wanted to ask was, okay, so most of these samples come from people walking into a clinic. So they're symptomatic, uh, they're just really the tip of the iceberg. What's going on with the base of the iceberg? How much diversity is there really in the virus population? And, and we can ask uh, uh, these kinds of questions using a technique where we estimate the effective population size of the virus using the coalescent. And, and remember I told you a phylogenetic tree is really a, a form in which we look at tips and we ask how do they coalesce or come together into the shared common ancestor. And I, I mentioned to you that if if any two variants or three variants shown here in red are drawn from a very large population, it will take them a long time, both in terms of evolutionary time and in terms of number of generations, uh, to coalesce or to find amongst all these individuals a shared common ancestor. And this will be reflected in these long branch links shown here. Conversely, as you get 
to smaller and smaller populations. And remember, we're sampling over time. So these are samples out of our minus 80 freezer that were taken deep, deeper in evolutionary time. And if, they take, if they're sampled from a small population, they'll coalesce onto a shared common ancestor much more quickly. And those are reflected in these small branch links. So it's really cool. We can actually uh, infer based on the diversity of these individuals, that is how long uh, the branch lengths are before they find a shared relative, the population size of the underlying base of the iceberg. So we can detect whether a virus is, whether it's sampling bias or whether a virus is truly emerging, where it started out as a small population and grew exponentially into a large population, coming from past to present, or whether the virus population is shrinking and we see this in some populations uh, in which it started sometime in the past as a very large population and shrank into the present. And the phylogenetic traces look very different with short branch lengths at the tips versus short branch lengths towards the roots. <coughs> so we did this with the dengue 4 viruses. And you can see that uh, this, this, tr this graphic is showing you the time series again. So we're sampling viruses through time. The black bars are showing you the number of confirmed viruses that were actually isolated. So these are the numbers, the abundances of the viruses that came into the clinics. And then this is the estimated population size shown here and shown by the red trace. And the red trace is the um, median and these are the they're equivalent to the 95% confidence intervals. And what's very interesting is that the trace, the dynamic in the virus diversity, is tracking the abundance of the viruses coming into the clinic. So that means that we're, we're, we don't have a sampling bias. In fact, clinical um, sampling is reflecting, and the size of the tip of the iceberg is really reflecting the size of the base of the iceberg. But what's even more interesting is uh, if you focus on the 1990 out, 98 outbreak is that the, the virus is really going through some crashes prior to these big emergence events. And that's kind of interesting because whenever virus populations or any kind of population suddenly crashes or shrinks and loses its diversity, uh, you basically reset the playing field and anything can happen because the, the storehouse of diversity in nature has suddenly lost its wealth. So these are diversity poor populations probably driven south by dynamics of the mosquito population, from which uh, natural, selecting, natural selection is acting on the remaining low standing variation to produce these emergent strains. And that's um, the, what the title of this slide is referring to. Dengue 4 undergoes true genetic bottlenecks, um, which make it susceptible to genetic drift prior to these selection events that produce emergent strains. So, Although many of us in evolutionary biology think adaptation is everything, uh, random genetic drift is also very important. And this just shows you how the, the phylogenetic tree uh, lines up with that peak event in which diversity is basically lost at an alarming rate before an emergent strain uh, appears and, and is selected by strong natural selection. So we still don't really know what these, ch these changes do. So um, the, the, the NS2A gene might have something to do with replication. Uh, we ran it through some cell model assays and the red viruses do replicate a little more quickly in cell culture, but we really wanna know what they do in mosquitoes. And that, for that, we're going to Puerto Rico. We're infecting different kinds of mosquitoes, different populations from around Puerto Rico to see what the virus is doing in the mosquito. It turns out that uh, the mutations that occurred in the West Nile virus that caused it to expand from the eastern seaboard to the, uh, across the country in 2001 were related to very subtle changes in, in the genome that conferred uh, a two-day earlier maturation rate in the mosquito. And it was a, a subtle phenotypic effect that was not detectable in cell culture models. So in many cases, we need to use the real mosquito to detect the phenotypic effects of some of these changes. So this is the Aedes aegypti mosquito shown here. Actually, this is Aedes albopictus, and this, this um, is an insectary that we have in Hawaii, and we have a similar one in Puerto Rico to do some of these experiments. So in the South Pacific, we have a different situation, and I, I won't talk about the other examples, but this is kind of curious because we have um, 
an, an instance where a virus, a very severe virus, showed up in Tahiti in 1971 and, and caused severe outbreaks in Tahiti and Fiji almost simultaneously, and in New Caledonia similarly. And, and these are very naive populations, and uh, when people were, were uh, bled after the fact, over 50% of everybody was infected in a single outbreak. It's, that's really phenomenally high. Uh, it showed up in Nui, and the, the analysis indicated that 90% of the people were infected in a single outbreak, and there were several deaths in, in Nui. And then a couple of years later, it showed up in Tonga, and it was almost silent transmission. There was a, a study going on for dirofilaria, which is a dog heartworm in mosquitoes and humans, and uh, they picked up some of the virus by accident. So it was really attenuated. So we wanted to know what, you know, what, what happened. M maybe this was a new introduction. How is the virus evolving in this situation to become attenuated? This is the way vaccines are made, by the way. People take a Petri dish or a rabbit, and they inoculate it with a really nasty virus. They let it grow, and they take a sample, and they put it in another Petri dish or a rabbit or something else. And they do this over and over again, passage after passage, until the virus is no longer severe. This is what's happening, and it happened in nature, which was really cool, and it happened in an exciting place. So uh, we wanted to know, you know, both in, in creating vaccines, attenuating viruses in nature or in the lab, how is, this, how is this happening and why? And it turns out that the virus that they isolated in Tonga is actually one of the dengue vaccine candidates. We don't have a dengue vaccine yet, but this is one of the candidates that we're working on. So it turns out that um, we did a phylogenetic inference. It was a single introduction from the Americas. And there were changes in two genes. So there were ho hot spots of evolution that were linked to a, a structural gene, the membrane gene, premembrane, and a non-structural gene, NS4A. So we're not really uh, uh, sure, but, but we're going to take these viruses to Tahiti and infect mosquitoes there. So this is the Tongan lineage. And it shows you the hot spots in PRM and NS4A, the, the vaccine candidates up there. So it's had, a, it's, it's had some artificial evolution in the lab, so we didn't count it as part of our lineage from Tonga. But, um, and then, then a subset had some changes in NS2A, which is still haunting me. It's a hot spot in the dengue genome that seems to be really important in evolutionary time. And uh, when we run our, our effective population size analysis through it, we can see that when the virus first occurred in the South Pacific, there was a huge uh, increase in its population size, which makes sense because it was in a new niche and it spread rapidly and uh, was responsible for several outbreaks in this time frame shown here in the 70s, early 70s. And then it kind of flatlined and almost became uh, less in terms of its abundance in the, in the Tongan population, which was so attenu attenuated. This suggests that, that um, Although uh, the, the Tongan viruses were asymptomatic, there was still plenty of them. So it's almost flatline. So that means the virus itself is phenotypically different in a given host. Not that there are fewer of them, but the virus does different things. And it suggests that uh, it, it's maybe related to, to, to maybe the immune response, which causes disease in dengue, and possibly the efficiency of the virus to infect different kinds of cells or more cells. So we run these in, in cell culture models, and we see a very subtle difference in mosquito cell lines between the Fiji strain, which was not attenuated, and the Tongan strain, which was attenuated. But we're going to run these in mosquitoes in Tahiti and see if we can see a phenotypic difference. So um, I won't give you the results of all of these studies, but basically we have changes in different kinds of gene regions depending on the kind of phenotype phenotypic change you observe and where in the genome it is. And, th and that's, that's really the uptake of this study on dengue, is that there is no holy grail for why dengue is emerging. There is no one genome hotspot. And not only that, there's no one uh, response to environmental change. So it's not all about replication in the virus, and it's not all about immune response that the virus is responding to. It depends. It depends on both the serotype this was dengue four. Dengue three, it was all traced to a, a change in the envelope gene. Um, and this was dengue two. So the, the bottom line is we know that the virus genome is important. It's under adaptive evolution. It's causing change. 
in, in disease response, but it's different. The, the diversity, that the way diversity is distributed in nature is different in each population. So selection is acting differently, but it's acting on different hotspots in the genome. And that relates back to why uh, genetic drift is important. And remember, this is a mosquito-borne virus. It's very different from HIV or influenza, in, in which are directly transmitted. And that might be the key, is that for viruses that go through these bottlenecks that, um, that, that are generated by crashes in mosquito populations, then maybe there is no holy grail or single answer er, or evolutionary response to changing human populations. So I just want to zoom through my time in Hawaii where um, dengue has had a checkered past. It, it showed up in the, in the 1800s, and it was called boohoo fever, which apparently it's very aptly named because when you get dengue, you go boohoo. <laughs> it's really apparently very miserable. There was severe outbreaks right about the time when the two mosquito species that vector dengue were introduced. So Hawaii is not endemic for mosquitoes. Mosquitoes were introduced to Hawaii with Westerners. Isn't that a shame? It just makes me weep when I think about it because it truly is paradise except for the mosquitoes. So there are now six species of mosquitoes and they've basically taken over. They're much more numerous than the tourists. <laughs> it's very unfortunate. So, so dengue virus has been alternating and, and, and slowly in today's climate, uh, Aedes albopictus is the primary vector. And in spite of many efforts to control um, the mosquito vector, which worked for Aegypti and wiped it out, but not Albopictus. Dengue transmission still occurs. And we had a, an interesting event in 2001 where a, an outbreak occurred in, in Oahu and on Maui. And the, the outbreak, the cases are shown here in, in the red spots around the different islands. Uh, the first case, the, what we call the index case, showed up in Hana. Has anybody ever been to Hana? Oh, it's, a, <laughs> it's hard to get to, right? Most people come, you know, come and fly into the middle of the island and then they drive two or three hours along a very twisty road where everybody gets car sick to get to Hana. It's very isolated. Cell phone reception is non-existent. Um, it's, it's a very small town. There, there is a Costco in the center of the island and, and people from Hana will drive out to Costco maybe once a week to stock up. But otherwise, it's very remote. And it turns out a school group went to Tahiti and uh, Tahiti was going through an incredible outbreak of dengue virus. And everybody, including the teacher that chaperoned the trip, came back and most of them had dengue virus. And they infected um, the mosquitoes in Hana. So it was, the, so it was the, the people moving the virus in their bodies, unbeknownst to them, to Hana, and then the local mosquitoes picked it up. And I was, at, I was doing my postdoc in Puerto Rico at the time, and we sent a CDC team over there to trace the dynamics of the outbreak, and they, they traced it to a phone booth in the middle of town, where everybody was going to make phone calls, and, and, and the poor local mosquitoes had become infected, and they were just feeding off the phone callers and, and, and spreading it spreading it around through that. So, it, so it's a really interesting case where the humans are moving the virus and the mosquitoes staying put, which is something that most people uh, don't appreciate. They always blame the mosquito, and it's not the mosquito. So when we, when we looked at the genetic relationships of these viruses, you see that, that all the Hawaiian strains except for one are here in pink. And they're completely interdigitated with the Tahiti strains, which confirms what the CDC epidemiology team found out, which was, was that these people had been to Tahiti and they'd gotten the virus. There was one virus from Oahu that was linked to a, a, a traveler that had been to Samoa uh, and uh, had brought the, the virus back from Samoa. So it was a very different virus. So there was lots of activity circulating. Uh, this is Dengue 1, and, and the viruses are all within this group and some are th in this group. And, and then in 1943, uh, we had uh, an isolate of dengue virus from Hawaii, which is shown here. So these are very different genetically. And so what we did was we put these into local mosquitoes to ask, is this virus any different from this virus, any different from the 1943 virus? And um, the only thing to note is that the 2001 virus in Tahiti was really wreaking havoc in terms of disease severity. It was causing a lot of disease, not on, in, in Oahu, but remember 
that, oh, that we're always sampling the tip of the iceberg. And in, in, on Oahu, there just was not enough cases to get the tip of that iceberg. So we didn't have any severe disease on Oahu, but the strain was associated with a lot of severe disease. So we took, we took a bunch of viruses shown here, sampled them from the different genetic diversity we had available to us in our minus 80 freezers and infected local Aedes albopictus mosquitoes with um, infectious blood meal. And I had three grad students, two technicians and myself up uh, for three nights in a row doing this all night long. It was really uh, a lot of work, but it was, it was a lot of fun too. So we'd have to, um, I hope no one's affectionate towards mosquitoes, but we, <laughs> we, we had to dissect them live, which was really terrible by first pulling their wings off and then pull their legs off. and. Then uh, yeah, so it was not very nice. But we cooled them down first so that they were mostly anesthetized and, and still. And, and then we'd, 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 keep them, we'd keep them growing virus over a certain time series, and, and we sampled them as, as we went. And we really wanted to know, um, you know, we wanted to ask that West Nile question. What, was the virus getting to the salivary glands any quicker uh, than, than some of its relatives? And was the virus replicating at a higher rate? And, I won't go through this in, in great detail, but, but the viruses that were caused severe disease, shown here in pink, did reach. Then we have the, we have the mid gut, the body, and the salivary glands. Now, the virus is being taken in by blood meal. It's going to the mid gut first. It's disseminating to the body, and then it's getting to the salivary glands for transmission. And these are the proportions of organs that were infected of the multiple individuals we sampled. And you can see that in 2001, they did, they, you know, a greater proportion of mid-guts were infected, and they did appear to reach the body and the salivary glands a little more quickly than some of the others. So we think that this virus is better in the mosquitoes. And in terms of abundance, we, we have kind of the same thing, and I won't dissect the the individual bar graphs, but if you blur your eyes, you can see that several of these, particularly um, by the time we reach day, day or, you know, early days, the salivary glands are showing lots of positive signal and high abundance of virus by the time we get, um, get to those early days in the 2001 viruses. So we think that we've identified some, some genetic diversity associated with virus uh, replicatability in and, and dissemination in the mosquitoes. So just to sum up some of the dengue work, we've found that emerging viruses are related to these genetically unique changes that occur at the bases of these lineages. We call them synapomorphies, or shared derived traits, of all the viruses that are emerging. That basically means that the virus genotype is important. It's not a neutral um, factor in that triangle, which could also be um, uh, described as, as responding to human factors and environmental factors. So virus genome is important. And that in, 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 many, in the comparative approach, that positive selection was driving some of the fixation, but the random genetic drift was very important in basically resetting the playing field of variation that's available, that's stored, on which selection can act. And that's very important. And that means that there is no one answer to why dengue virus is emerging in different populations and in different conditions over different time periods. So we've, rep we've, we've done some assays to try to discern what the relevant phenotypes are. Whether these fixations have occurred randomly or by strong selection, we, we still need to know what kind of phenotype is being acted upon by selection. And we've found that replication is, is very important and might be one of the important factors in what dengue virus is responding to or with the phenotype that it's, uh, it's uh, being selected to, to optimize. So, um, you know, this is all virus evolution over the last few hundred years over a time frame when humans have really changed their population dynamics and their relationships with the mosquitoes that have co-evolved with humans. So I want to step back and look a little bit more uh, deeper in evolutionary time at events that, are, that have occurred in, in small mammal communities. So uh, I use a population to refer to a group of animals of the same species. A community is a group of, of animals from many different species that interact. So dengue virus is a host specialist. It's not really, it's, it's switched into humans and that's it. It's not really evolved to be extremely um, 
host, non-host specific. And so we, we don't need to really consider host communities so much as host populations. But in some of the viruses I study, West Nile is an example of something that's not very host specific. And hantaviruses appear to be very nimble at switching hosts, and they've done it numerous times over their evolutionary histories. And so in, instead of asking the question over recent evolutionary time, how is, how is dengue virus evolved uh, to, you know, to, to, to produce these emergent disease-causing phenotypes, we really want to ask, what are the genetic hotspots or what are the patterns that, that are shaping hantavirus evolution? And we use hantaviruses because like flu, it's a segmented genome instead of a single genome. And it, it, it's, it appears to be very nimble in terms of its ability to switch into new small mammal hosts. And we assume that these small mammal communities are interacting in a way uh, ecologically that maybe promotes these host switch events. So, so probably most people recall hantaviruses from the Four Corners outbreak that occurred in the 80s and 90s, we've had activity. Whenever rodents like mice and rats uh, go through a population boom, which is always related to El Nino and rainfall and the seed bank that's available, then uh, we see hantavirus spillover into, into humans. And uh, what, what we've found is that, um, that, that really that's just the tip of the iceberg. That actually the hantaviruses that are occurring in rats and mice and this is the, the clade of rats and mice, and their hantaviruses shown here. It's just one small sampling of hantavirus evolution and diversity that's occurring in nature. And all of these hosts, which include shrews and moles, have hantaviruses, and the hantaviruses are shown here. So actually the hantaviruses that are occurring in, in mice and rats, they actually came from hantaviruses that, um, that occurred in, in shrews and moles. And so we're very fascinated to understand you know, where hantaviruses came from and, and uh, what's driving their diversity today as, as, human pop as habitat degradation and human population growth and increases in in some of the rodent species and d diversity loss of some of the host species um, is occurring. So, so this, these red bars um, attach the virus to the host that it's been recorded in. And, and what's very interesting is what we call the congruency or the matching up of the virus tree and the host tree. And, and what that suggests is that after the virus switches into a new host, it tracks that host. So there's been a lot of tracking of, of host speciation by viruses, and this is reflected in how the virus speciates. So to say that this is a nimble virus is actually not true. It's pretty host-specific once it's switched into a new host. But it's still capable of switching. So we have uh, shown in green lines events where there is incongruency, where the virus tree no longer matches up with the host tree. And this reflects an event in evolutionary time in which, for example, um, you know, a, a mole picked up a virus that was normally occurring in, in rodents, shown up here, because it's associated with that clade. And this has happened a couple of times in the evolutionary history of hantaviruses. So we're c currently exploring the idea of hantavirus hotspots that confer host switch and host specificity because they're two sides of the same coin and we need to understand them both to understand the propensity of hantaviruses to uh, emerge. Um, that the idea that hantaviruses are tracking host evolution, that they're speciating together, is a very controversial idea because we don't know the mechanism by which that would happen. The, the um, hosts are evolving over time scales of millions of years, but the viruses, when we do a virus tree and we try to date these coalescent events, we come up with an, an, a scale of ancestry amongst the hantaviruses of only 255,000 uh, years. So when we try to calibrate the virus trees with the host evolutionary trees, uh, the, the time scales uh, become, this is supposed to be an M, millions of years, uh, sorry, two, 2 million years, 2.2 million years, for some of the uh, timescales of, of shared common ancestry of the hantaviruses, which is really hard to imagine for an RNA virus. And so we're, we're really trying to, and you can't get fossilized viruses, they don't exist, and they don't preserve well in the fossil record. So it's been a real challenge to understand the timescale of this co-speciation. 
and we're trying to um, infer the mechanisms of, co of co divergence. Is it co speciation or is it maybe the virus just tracking the host through constraints on host specificity, for example? So, these, these whole community level questions how, how viruses are shared amongst different species of hosts how diversity in those populations and communities of viruses is stored and acted upon is really becoming realized in some of our studies of arboviruses, uh, mosquito communities and their viruses in Southeast Asia. So our, our, our ultimate interest is really to understand how diversity is stored across these very different environments. And this becomes really important both because uh, environmental degradation is occurring through the anthropogenic change farming, urbanization, for example, loss of diversity um, that's normally stored in these kinds of environments, loss of host diversity. How is this affecting, how is the diversity of these host communities affecting the diversity of pathogen communities? We have a hypothesis that um, as you move, uh, as you lose host diversity, shown here in these vertebrates, birds and primates, for example. As you degrade host diversity and you move from a jungle environment, which is, has a relatively healthy and biodiverse community, towards an agricultural community, which has got um, a few species dominating, such as domesticated ducks and chickens and pigs, uh, to an urban environment where you have maybe one main species and the mosquitoes that have co-evolved with it dominating. How do you change the pathogens that are there in stored? And uh, this bar graph shows, you, shows the hypothesis. The gray bars is the diversity of the different hosts. And the colored bars are the diversities of the different microbes or pathogens that might be stored in the host. And the different colors and their relative abundances show you how, how, you know, how relatively abundant and how many different colors, many different species there might be present. When you move towards this environment, you imbalance that pattern. So our hypothesis is that if you move into a suburban or agricultural environment, then you have certain colors dominating. So certain hosts become dominant and certain viral pathogens or bacterial pathogens become dominant. Um, this is the case in terms of both the emergence of swine flu occurred in a pig farm in, in Mexico. It was able to evolve there because the pig farm, uh, the pigs basically uh, sampled viruses from birds and human and swine sources and provided a melting pot or a recombination chamber to produce the swine flu that then became so efficient at transmitting amongst humans. Uh, same with H5N1. Highly pathogenic influenza uh, was, was sampled by these highly concentrated uh, domesticated bird populations that then provided the perfect arena uh, for the survival of a more virulent form of the virus. So you get imbalances in both the number of species present and the abundance of those species when you modify hosts to become dominant over the other in the community. And then if you move over to this scenario, we get something like um, West Nile virus and dengue. You have urban environments where humans dominate or the animals that have co-evolved with humans, whether it's mosquitoes or crows, or doves, or rats, or mice, you get a huge perturbation in the diversity of hosts that causes a concomitant perturbation or imbalance in the diversity of the, of the microbes. So, uh, like I said, this is a hypothesis, and, and we're testing this in Southeast Asia by sampling across a habitat gradient where we go from a very um, a highly biodiverse national park called Kaoyai National Park through to a peri-urban environment called Nakonayok, town of Nakonayok. And we sampled the different environments here using um, devices that collect the adult mosquitoes. And we try to uh, select um, our traps to, to accurately reflect the diversity of adult mosquitoes in these communities. So the, the location of the study is in central Thailand, shown here. And what, what we really wanted, what, what, we're kind of taking advantage of the mosquito as a flying hypodermic needle. So it, it's, it's flying around and it's not only sampling, not only are we sampling the mosquitoes, but we can also collect the blood meals that they sampled. So they're sampling the host biodiversity for us. 
Their, their own biodiversity is also important. And, and of course, the pathogens or endosymbionts that they contain are also an important response variable to, to our transect of, of habitat biodiversity and anthropogenic change. So it's been an adventure, and we're taking advantage of um, next generation sequencing techniques to, to plumb the diversity of these communities of mosquitoes. So the pie graphs show you the different communities of mosquitoes. You can see as we move to an urban environment, a, a specifically well-adapted urban mosquito is showing up. Culex kinka fasciatus and Aedes aegypti are both present. Um, so what we can do is we, we use these next generation sequencing techniques to, to look at the diversity of the, of the genetic signatures in these populations. So this graph shows you one of the genes that we've been focusing on. It's, it's a ribosomal gene that's uh, present in microbial communities and microbes in bacteria. And we can ask how many different types of bacteria are present in the different kinds of mosquito communities that we're sampling. Uh, actually, we're focusing on three of the major pathogenic mosquitoes for now, but we're doing it through uh, for all of the species that we're studying. So next generation sequencing techniques are, 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 are uh, very powerful tools because you don't need to know anything about what you hope to find in the sample. They use uh, anonymous techniques to grab any fragment of genetic material in a, in a population or in an environmental sample and sequence it randomly. So you don't need what we call primers. Normally for all the dengue work and all the hantavirus work, I've had to know I was looking for dengue or I was looking for hantavirus and I would have to use primers, these little tags uh, called, that are, are short sequences of DNA to, to bind to my target and sequence it. So now I don't need to know the target we use techniques that, that instead bind the, ge the genetic material to a bead at random and then sequence the, off the bead. So the bead becomes the primer, basically. So it's a very powerful technique. And it's, it's uh, been used for, for this kind of application uh, increasingly for environmental samples. And it's called metagenomics. We're trying to understand the metagenome of a given sample, uh, whether that be seawater or ice or... or um, lakes or mosquitoes. So we're using the mosquitoes as our microcosm. And uh, it allows us not only to simultaneously detect unique signatures of microbes, but also of um, host signatures. So in this case, of the, it contained in the blood meal that they might have ingested. So in this case, in these three species, we can see that the, the number of species of unique genetic signatures, we call them OTUs, or uh, operationally taxonomic units, operational taxonomic units, uh, increases with the number of the depth of our sequencing procedure. So, and what we really want to do is find the, 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 the number of OTUs, which reflects the diversity. When we sample enough, we should reach a plateau. If we haven't reached a plateau, then we haven't sampled enough. In, in uh, this example, we were trying to determine how the, whether, how many mis, um, Mosquitoes we pooled would make a difference. And in this case, we compared urban, suburban, and rural. And we found, indeed, that, that the rural samples took a lot longer to reach an asymptote of biodiversity, of peak biodiversity, than the other samples. And so from that, we conclude that, uh, indeed, compared to suburban and urban habitats, rural habitats are more biodiverse in terms of the microbes that infect mosquitoes. And, and many of these are shown here. These are all bacteria from the 18S RNA um, a probe. And, and the different mosquitoes are shown here, suburban, urban, rural, and, and rural. And they, they really group by species. You can see the groupings above. So, so these are bacteria that are very species specific, but they are increasing in terms of their diversity as we move into uh, rural environments for a given species of hosts. So we have a, we, we, we can sample uh, back through, t so, th so th that's some preliminary data on the biodiversity study that um, kind of ties some of the earlier studies on dengue and hantaviruses that I spoke to you about all together. And that is that, that viruses are responding to environmental conditions, not only uh, to selective pressures, but also to drift. And we see this really clearly in dengue and the human health impacts that, that result from that. 
um, there are hot spots in both the dengue genome that confer different kinds of phenotypes that are important, whether it be replication or, or a response to immune escape. Uh, they're, both, they're both very important. Uh, in the hantavirus work, we're still trying to identify the, where, what confers the nimbleness for, for host switching, but it, it looks like host uh, specificity has been very important. And so these viruses are generally more or less constrained with some propensity to host switch deep in evolutionary time. So what we really want to do, both from these lessons and from our arbovirus study, is to ask where diversity is stored in nature. And w once we understand where diversity is, is stored in nature, we can take the lessons we've learned on what might be driving evolution and apply it to some of these communities that really vary a lot in terms of their biodiversity. And they're, they're tracking a phenomenon that we're seeing globally. The, the global loss of biodiversity across many human communities and, um, and, and natural communities, which, which could really set the stage for um, a loss of biodiversity and an imbalance in the, in the diversity of pathogens and how they might affect human health. So uh, that's where we're going with this. Anyway, I thank you all for listening. I went over time. <laughs> Are there any questions? I should say that um, I want to acknowledge my team here. Um, this is my daughter. She's seven, and she's really great mosquito bait. <laughs> we never let them bite her. We just set her up in the field, and then we sample around. <laughs> she's great. And I have many grad students and Thai collaborators that have helped out, too, along the way. Um, Shannon, can I ask? One question about the, sure. the number that you uh, quoted earlier in the talk uh, about the percentage of successful genetic changes. I think it was like 0.13 or something like that in life. Oh, yeah. yeah so does that vary between viruses and, you know, us DNA people? So, you know, that, that's a good question. And it really depends on the study. There, there, there's been different numbers that have come up. But, but in general, um, there, there's a really, that evolution is really about constraints, right? So, so we're all the products of millions of years of evolution, and it, we work, things work. And so what we, the phenomenon we tend to see in most cases is that evolution, um, significant evolution is constrained. And, and uh, that is that, you know, you don't want to break what's already working. So in, in most cases, mutations that do occur in organisms that are the product of millions of years of evolution are deleterious, and so they're strongly selected against. And that's why we see that DNDS ratio almost always uh, fall below one, because DN, a non-silent changes, changes that affect the amino acids and the proteins, are uh, often deleterious, so they're selected against. And um, the other side of the equation is that is, is, is just the raw amount of variation that's available. Okay. And, and in viruses, yes, there's much more mutations are generated at every cycle of replication than we have generated in eukaryote replication. So there's more raw material available in viruses for uh, selection or drift to act on. Okay. So you'd expect that that would vary over time for a particular species? Yeah, so over time, we see, you know, vi viruses evolve much more quickly, for example, than, than humans and other um, eukaryotic organisms, mm -hmm. even but mosquitoes. So if I'm a, you know, humans looking in the future, then hum future humans will have less successful changes. Is that, is that a fair yeah, uh, so understanding of, of where we're at? Yeah, so humans evolve very slowly. Uh, and, and the humans, the mutations that we see in our population today are mostly linked to disease phenotypes. Some are neutral. So, let other people have questions. I'm sure there's. I have two questions. Uh, a friend of mine nearly died in the South Pacific of dengue fever. Oh, I'm sorry. So I hope you are working really hard on preventive <laughs> medication. Um, if you are, would you need to have one kind, four kinds, or a hundred kinds to be successful in? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there are, there are, I showed you those four kinds of dengue, 
and that, they're, that, that the major thing that determines um, their difference in terms of how we perceive them is our response, our immuno, immunogenic response. So they have these changes in, in envelope primarily in the structural regions that make each one of them look unique to a human, but within any one species. All those other changes don't seem to look different to a human, to our immune response. So we're really effective. Once we've been exposed to a dengue 4, uh, even if it's one we caught in Tahiti, we'll mount an effective immune response against all dengue 4, because they all look the same to our immune system. But the other serotype will look very different. So we have to design a vaccine that, that captures the look and the immunogenic response, the immune response, to each one. So uh, the, the, the other challenge that I didn't want to get into here is that if you have had dengue once, you're immune to whichever serotype you had, we think, for life. But you're more likely, if you are exposed to another dengue virus, you're more likely to get sicker than if you'd never been exposed to dengue at all. And that's basically because your immune system recognizes the dengue virus, but it doesn't mount an effective response to it. It doesn't kill it. It just ends up upregulating all your immune cells, your B cells and your T cells, providing more fodder for the virus to grow, because it grows in those cells, the B cells, and, and more of an inflammatory response, and you're not killing off the virus. So, so your friend has got to stay out of dengue endemic areas, because he's probably more likely to develop more severe forms of the disease, because he's already had it. And the last thing we want to do is vaccinate a bunch of people against one type and then have them develop more severe disease when they get exposed to another type, especially now that the virus has gone global. It's pantropic and it's now overlapping in range across the board. So, so there, is, there, are, there are two or three vaccine candidates that are now in phase three trials, which means that we are looking at a vaccine in, in the next five years probably. So I'll be out of work, but it'll be a good thing. It's a, it's, yeah, it's a vaccine that combines the envelope region of all four into one uh, mix. So it's basically a, a, a vaccine that's a, a, it's called tetravalent. It has all four signatures in the same vaccine. Could, could I ask one more brief one? I, I've read several places that hundreds of thousands of deaths in Africa from mosquito-borne malaria could have been avoided if we weren't so obsessive about not intelligently using DDT. Is the same thing true of the mosquito populations that are thick with dengue? So um, I showed you how in, in, in the Caribbean and Central and, Central and South America, I, in Puerto Rico, the, you know, the virus came back. There was a, a big introduction in the late 70s. And that's really correlated with um, the, the, when, when the Panama Canal was going in, and yellow fever was rampant in that whole part of the world, there was very uh, active and aggressive adult mosquito campaigns to, ki to kill off the adults, and that was primarily DDT. And so in the, between the 40s and the 70s, that there was, a, there was a, all the 80s Egypti was wiped out of that area because that's the vector of yellow fever. And so the mosquito populations came back after DDT treatment stopped. The, the problem with DDT and any adulticide is that Sure, if you have the resources, it, it's maybe very effective, but it has to be sustained, and it's not really sustainable. Even if we found, and there are other adulticides in the market that are being used, but they really, in all the populations where this study, a thorough study has been done throughout, say, Southeast Asia, where they've been able to both do adulticides to target the adults, but also target other life, life history stages of the mosquito, a combined approach is much more effective. So source, we call it source reduction. So redu educating people, and they've done a fantastic study in Puerto Rico that just showed simple, really efficient educational campaigns at low cost, teaching people to reduce the numbers of mosquitoes breeding around their homes by dumping containers of water that they stored. Simple, simple concepts could knock the dengue virus transmission down effectively. But you have to keep educating people to reduce the sources of the mosquitoes. And it's more effective and in, in, in sustainable than adulticide programs. Just a couple more questions. Um, I have a question extending what you were talking about in terms of source reduction. 
it seems like with our globalized society, <coughs> we have uh, exacerbated a number of problems. Uh, some of those are due to the fact that now you think people move around a lot more, and so they themselves are the primary vectors of, of this, uh, of, a, of a global uh, uh, endemics. Uh, and the other thing is, is that economically we have a system set up to localize and try to drive the most profitability uh, at the lowest level uh, out of certain areas, and then that's without regard necessarily for health uh, and source reduction in those areas, and those groups might actually be the primary source of a lot of ep epidemics uh, as well. And uh, that if we drove some economics into source redu reduction and health treatment in those areas, they more than pay off the, uh, um, re for the reduction of the endemics. Has there been a, much thought about that? You know, it's it's um, definitely something that's on people. It's a great question. Uh, it's something that's been on on people's minds that that we you know we are now a global economy and a global society. Uh, and unfortunately, the economy part of it is still much much uh, so much based on country economics, right? But we know that pathogens and infectious diseases and the migration of all kinds of species it knows no borders. So, uh, so, th so it's it's extremely um, important. Uh, I I usually apply to the National Institutes of Health for my federal funding, and it's really only been in the last few years that the director of NIH has has now um, uh, put in place uh, the idea that we think need to think globally. We need to partner when we apply for grants to study the infectious diseases with countries outside of our own, where the infectious diseases occur, that could be providing the sources for the United States as a sink. And no, more, you know, numerous times this has been in indicated that, uh, that, you know, if we don't start to think globally, we'll, we'll continue to be a, a sink for many infectious diseases that are thriving uh, globally at, in our neighbors' countries, in Mexico and in other countries we have strong economic ties with, that, um, that don't have the resources to control some of the infectious diseases or study them or understand where they're coming from. So the emergence of many flus, influenza strains is, is in South China, for example. Um, in, in Mexico, we have dengue, uh, and in, in, in many countries in the Caribbean, we have dengue virus, which seeded the Florida outbreaks, for example, and seeds numerous uh, transmission events in, t in Texas and Louisiana every year. So, so uh, it's one thing to say that it's important. It's another thing to act on it, and I would say we're, we're still behind, but the awareness is there and people are starting to think more internationally in terms of the scientific research anyway and the funding behind it. Uh, just one last question. Uh, if you have any more questions. All right, so um, you talked about how there were spikes in the reported cases of dengue fever after there was a drop in the population. Yeah. So if that's not just a function of mosquito population, what would be the mechanism that causes the rise in cases? Right, so, so there's been a lot of studies in, 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 in Puerto Rico, for example, where we can take really good uh, climate data, temperature and humidity data, and m monitor mosquito populations in different regions of Puerto Rico. And, and Puerto Rico is really a heterogeneous climate. There are dry areas and there are wet areas. There are um, areas of dense human, um, uh, human population growth where the housing quality maybe hasn't kept up, so people are very exposed to mosquito bites, for example. Um, and and the, the models show that, you know, it's really uh, many factors that are involved. So certainly when mosquitoes are abundant, seasonally abundant, that's driving all the seasonal dynamics of dengue virus. We just don't get the dengue virus reported at the clinics in the dry season. It turns out that the virus is not going extinct. We've shown that from our phylogenetic trees. It's not being re-imported from other countries. It still persists. It's just that when the population goes down, we're in the base of the iceberg instead of the tip of the iceberg. So we're just not sampling it, but we know it's there. But it, so it's very, the abundance definitely of the virus is responding to the abundance of the mosquitoes. But all things being equal, that is that the virus, the abundance of the mosquitoes are going up and down, um, seasonally, and that different years, like El Nino, for example, might have more abundant mosquitoes or less. So all things being equal, the, the, it's the, the, for some of those pe really peak events, 
has been linked to some of the unique changes in the virus genome. So our hypothesis is that uh, the viruses that we observed uh, driving the 1998 epidemic, and there was an early one in 94, and then since then there's been very bad epidemics in 2010 of dengue virus. There, there are some unique changes in the, in the viral genome that might make it uh, for the abundant mosquito populations or non-abundant that are present more efficient at replicating in those mosquitoes. And that's what we, the, it's really about the mechanisms, you're right. And, and what we want to do is take those viruses that are associated with these outbreaks and, and respond to our hypothesis. Okay, if there's a hot spot in a gene that does drive replication, does this translate into a change in the virus's behavior in the mosquitoes that are present? So we like to use local mosquitoes because all mosquitoes are not equal. The, the Egypti that are present in Puerto Rico are very different from the ones in Southeast Asia or in Florida. So we try to use local mosquitoes and ask what the mechanism might be for making that virus better for it and worse for us. It's <laughs> a good question. Shannon, we have a, um, oh. a, a, a mug here. Hopefully you're not tempted to leave that open uh, with any water <laughs> in it or anything <laughs> like that in your labs. Yeah. Exactly. Great. Please join me in thanking Shannon for her Thanks great talk. Much.